In the dynamic world of maritime leadership, it is my great pleasure to introduce a true luminary and driving force in our industry. Today, we are honored to welcome our keynote speaker, someone whose leadership has not only shaped the trajectory of the American P&I Club, but has also left an indelible mark on the maritime community. During her illustrious career of almost 20 years of working for the club, she has climbed the steep ladder from claims executive to spearheading global business development to deputy COO and today CEO. Last year, I had the chance to sit down with Dorothea during our New York Maritime Women in Shipping interview to discuss what it means to be a strong female presence in a male-dominated industry. Her advocacy for women in leadership serves as a role model for what this industry for, should strive for today. Dorothea stands as a trailblazer for women in our industry, and her role as CEO not only speaks volumes about her capabilities, but serves as an inspiration for aspiring leaders breaking barriers. Dorothea's reflections on the role of clean energy in an ever-changing and interconnected world will inspire and challenge us to think boldly about the path forward. Her insights will set the stage for a day filled with invaluable discussions and forward-thinking perspectives. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in, in extending a warm welcome to the CEO of the American P&I Club, Dorothea Iwano. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so very much for that very, very kind uh, introduction, um, Sophia. So, clean energy in a changing, yes, and interconnected world. First of all, I want to say that I am absolutely honored to be here today um, at the 30th annual Hellenic American and Norwegian American Chambers of Commerce Shipping Conference. It's um, it's truly a a privilege to have the opportunity to relay some of my thoughts and reflections on the theme of the conference um, and what I consider in our in industry an interconnected world. Uh, as everyone in this room, I think, knows, the formula for the maritime industry's success uh, is deeper than the simple necessity to transport people and goods in an efficient manner. The formula for success lies in the people of our industry the multinational, multicultural, multi-sector, multi-expert people who connect continuously and most of the time seamlessly or at least appearing to be seamlessly to most of the world on a global scale. Oh, sorry guys. <laughs> yes, it's the people that make up the industry that are key to the formula. Um, and the strength of the amazing relationships that we forge within this magnific magnificent maze of shipping transactions. And there's no better venue to celebrate these relationships and the advantages they bring, not just to the industry, but to the world, um, than at this annual event, which not only offers a forum every year for individuals from all maritime professions, regardless of trade or sector or point in the chain, to exchange ideas and knowledge, but creates an avenue which reaches people beyond these traditional borders of the shipping industry and promotes the value of commerce on a global scale. Recent years, as we all know, um, have been riddled with disruption, from COVID and the pandemic to the geopolitical shockwaves that are rever reverberating as we speak in the Red Sea and beyond. We're developing and we're adopting technologies on an unprecedented scale, and we're seeing rapid changes in our global fleet as well as in our workforce, which give rise to great concern, actually, for safety in particular. The evolving landscape of sanctions is impacting global trade and operational policies more than ever. And then, of course, there is the matter of addressing the green agenda and decarbonization, the regulatory framework that must continue to evolve and accompany that, and the issue of financing these transitions. There can be no doubt that we are facing daunting challenges. And this year, in 2024, we face them during what has been called by Time in a December article as the ultimate election year, with national elections taking place in 64 countries, including the United States, the United Kingdom, and the European Union, not to mention Ukraine, Russia, Iran, and Taiwan. The article estimates that about half the global population will be called to polls for national elections during 2024, the results of which will no doubt have consequences in determining the course of all of our futures. 
In the meantime, we must navigate in a storm of uncertainty that comes with this. So where do we start? We start together. The fact is that while we may not resolve these complex and undeniably interconnected issues today, by engaging in this forum and leveraging our collective knowledge and relationships, we perhaps can spark initiatives to move closer towards finding solutions that not only benefit the environment, but also benefit the industry in ways that secure the safety and well-being of seafarers, energy stability, and resilience of commerce and communities around the world. We must not doubt that all we do as an industry is interconnected, and this necessitates a 360-degree view and strategy. Shipping must decarbonize, yes, not just to meet the regulatory requirements that have been imposed, but also because this is the evolution that is taking place around the world. But as we chart this course, we need to carefully balance the need for energy stability and security, as well as matters affecting safety with the feasibility of implementing clean energy solutions. For example, the diversion of maritime traffic from the Red Sea due to security concerns, presents a number of ongoing challenges for our most precious resource, that of our seafarers, and at least one other unintended but interconnected consequence for the shipping sector, that of heightened carbon emissions. This poses a challenge in managing the IMO's mandated carbon intensity indicator requirement starting from January 1, 2024. Ships may need to operate at reduced speeds generally to meet emission targets, but rerouting around Africa could affect the emissions and their meeting the regulatory requirements. Furthermore, as we manage the journey through the energy transition, we must also remember the paramount importance of safety. This must be done within the context of crew competency um, as a challenge and to address the skill shortages in the face of emerging technology and alternatives in ship propulsion. A prominent challenge arises from the shortage of skilled crew members underscoring a need for focused attention. I don't know if many of you have seen, but according to BIMCO ICS Seafarers Workforce Report of 2021, the global fleet will require nearly 90,000 officers by 2026 to operate effectively. This demand is particularly pronounced for officers with technical expertise. The COVID pandemic further exacerbated the problem, disrupting training programs and leaving seafarers unequipped to handle the rapid technological advancements reshaping the maritime landscape. Indeed, we believe in the P&I sector that this convergence probably caused many of the elevated levels of casualties during 20 and 21, in 21 especially. The advancement of technology appears to continue to outpace training efforts, resulting in a widening gap between skills required and those available. This is compounded by the need for new skills and practices to meet the safety challenges of the energy transition and the development of the use of alternative fuels and transportation generally. And one spotlight to focus on here is the challenge on, of fires on board vessels, which has emerged as a leading cause of marine insurance losses by value. In this context, the development and usage of lithium batteries present significant challenges for seafarers, similar to those faced, of course, by shoreside firefighters. Of course, a major difference between shoreside firefighters and seafarers is that that is the core purpose and job of shoreside firefighters unlike seafarers. Lithium batteries have become popular due to their high energy density and application in various devices from consumer electronics to electric vehicles. However, they do pose certain risks, such as thermal runway, overheating, the potential for fires or explosions. And these risks are necessarily compounded in a maritime environment, where access to external help and resources in an emergency situation will be limited. Indeed, we've seen the results of this in tragic sinkings of car carriers. And while statistics so far show that the likelihood of casualties of fires related to lithium batteries is not heightened as compared to traditional energy sources, the real issue is that lithium battery fires are more difficult to control and extinguish due to their ability to reignite even after apparently having been extinguished. And if the use of these batteries as an alternative propulsion is to continue and sea carriage the method of transport for the trade, then is it really that seafarers, on top of already 
heavy lift in training will need to also be trained in advanced firefighting techniques specific to lithium battery fires. This is just one issue that highlights the crew safety challenge interconnected with the clean energy transition. Furthermore, the pressure of the maritime industry to facilitate the energy transition away from fossil fuels, driving investment in the use of alternative fuels such as ammonia and hydrogen, increases safety risks and amplifies the demand not only for the proficient seafarer who can navigate these intricate systems, but research and development for, to best prepare for the scenarios that we will inevitably face in their long-term use. Human error has always been the major contributor to maritime casualties, and the fast pace of new technologies will not only create new types of risk to manage, but will exacerbate the already high probability of accidents as a result of it. The maritime industry must naturally adapt to play its part in meeting global targets and emission goals. And the PI industry within this context will always play a key role in supporting technological advancement and the green transition as we function overall as a guarantor for all involved in the chain. This, however, must be done with a logical and measured approach. This necessitates a collective commitment from all stakeholders, not only operators who ultimately bear the risk through their mutual insurers, but includes manufacturers of technology, training institutions, industry bodies, and regulatory authorities. And these are just examples of why the decarbonization of global shipping by 2050, the achievement of net zero by that date, is arguably the greatest challenge the maritime community has ever faced. While the current energy transition is certainly not the first transition that we've gone through and that the world has ever faced, I dare say it is probably the most complicated. Decarbonization, the process of reducing carbon emissions and transitioning to cleaner energy sources is indeed a global imperative. And this was made very clear and recognized at the UN Climate Change Conference late last year, the COP28. However controversial some of the aspects surrounding last year's conference may have been. However, the reality is that the efficacy of decarbonization efforts is also affected by significant disparities between nations around the world. These disparities manifest in various forms, including economic development levels, uh, technological capabilities, access to resources, and political will. Indeed, we've seen how perceived disparities can lead to friction among nations and even withdrawal from international agreements. Furthermore, the development of alternative fuels can also mean diversion of, of resources needed elsewhere. An often quoted and synonymous definition in terms of sustainability is that it serves to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. In other words, we must still meet the needs of the present, and this must also mean balancing disparities. Economic disparities. Developed nations often have more resources and obviously technological expertise to invest in clean energy transitions and clean energy infrastructure and decarbonization efforts. Conversely, developing nations may face financial constraints and competing priorities, making it challenging to transition. The economic divide can result in discrepancies in the pace and the scale of these efforts and conflicting national regulations, not only blocking progress towards the reduction goals, but also polarizing nations. And technological disparities. Advanced technologies such as renewable energy systems, energy storage, carbon capture and storage, are crucial for effective decarbonization. However, access to these technologies varies widely between nations. Going to resource disparities, the availability of renewable energy resources such as sunlight, wind, and water varies geographically. Some regions have abundant renewable energy potential, while others may rely more heavily on fossil fuels due to resource constraints. We cannot ignore resentment of developing countries towards developed nations with respect to the years of opportunity connected with the production, use, and trade of fossil fuels. As we address these challenges within the maritime sector, for our own part, it is, of course, important that we recognize that we are really already one of the most efficient and environmentally friendly modes of transportation 
Um, and despite this, we are still working very hard to improve our, our performance and accountability for environmental responsibility. Let's not forget, though, where we are and why it matters. Transportation by sea accounts for about 90% of the world trade by volume, 80% by value, yet it is responsible for less than 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions. These are impressive statistics, and the shipping industry deserves credit for them. We also know that over the past few years, there has been a significant shift towards sustainable practices in maritime operations. And one of the key areas of progress is the adoption of cleaner and more efficient propulsion technologies and policies. The introduction of low emission and zero emission vessels, such as those powered by electric, hydrogen, ammonia, LNG, biofuels, or hybrid systems, is reducing the industry's reliance on the traditional fossil fuels. And while this is laudable, accessibility, cost, scale, and safety in carriage and use remain looming issues. In addition, as the green fuel momentum builds, it is also crucial to address the lack of a comprehensive regulatory regime that adequately considers emerging alternative fuels in the maritime sector. Currently existing international maritime conventions relating to liability for pollution and corresponding compensation do not adequately address the unique risks associated with these alternative fuels, leaving potential legal challenges and insurance risk in the event of accidents or environmental incidents. As the industry transitions towards the cleaner energy sources, there is a pressing need for regulatory frameworks that establish limits of, sorry, limits of liability and that ensure environmental safety. As a result, policymaker collaboration with industry stakeholders to develop robust regulatory mechanisms and promote the adoption of these fuels while safeguarding environmental and public interests is imperative. But let me take a step back and give some perspective here. Speaking from the American Club's perspective, a third party marine liability insurer whose purpose is to identify and assess risk in the maritime world, change always brings about new risk to rise up to. So from that angle, I suppose I could just sit back and say, it's business as usual, acting as a safety net for the world of constant modernization and advancement. However, is this really the answer, to just move without strategy and rely on those of us who absorb the financial fallout? I think not. And I believe the industry has proven that that's not how they see themselves in the world. In fact, in a constantly changing and interconnected world, the maritime industry has always stood as a symbol of resilience, adaptability, and progress. So despite the challenges, I do have confidence. Confidence not because I know that we will meet these challenges particularly easy, but confidence because my experiences have shown that when faced with change, the maritime industry as a whole does not just adapt, it attaches itself to opportunity and it thrives. And let's take the world of marine insurance. When traditional commercial insurers began to withdraw from the rising liabilities emerging from increasing regulation and judicial decisions around the world, ship owners banded together and took the risk into their own hands and they created what we now know as mutual P&I clubs. Not only did they create their own safety net and build the foundation for supporting all stakeholders in the global chain of trade, but they created it in such a way that it allowed it to adapt and develop to absorb the continually changing risk landscape of liabilities. Now this leads me actually to what I think is an interesting story and that's the birth of the American Club as there couldn't be a more fitting example of collaborative industry solution to crisis, this time arising interestingly given the current climate from sanctions. During World War I in 1916 through the impact of the UK's trading with the enemy act, the American maritime operators found themselves unable to insure in the UK and consequently without the ability to insure with the British P&I clubs. The United States maritime industry, however, stepped up to the challenge and found a solution and they brought together American operators, a major marine insurance broker, and the support of government to create and give birth to the first and to this day only American P&I club on February 14th, 1917. Our birthday is coming up soon. I suppose the United Kingdom at that time did not expect that their blacklisting sanctions to prov would provoke the birth of such a solution, but that's exactly what it did. 
and the birth of the PNI Club, the birth of PNI and the American Club, and the development of the international group are the perfect examples of an industry which, despite the competitive foundation, have come together to protect the world's oceans, ports, people, communities, and support the very veins of global trade, creating what I call a safety net for all stakeholders. But it goes further than that. It's a safety net for progress, because every transition requires courage, courage to take the first steps, the first leap. And we know that every first step creates new risk, and that will inevitably include mistakes along the way. Without collaborative innovation of one of the largest reinsurance platforms in the world, namely that of the IG, I dare to say that any transition would be that more difficult and that much slower. However, as I said earlier, simply relying on the classic safety net to absorb the shocks without strategy or care is certainly not the solution. As a third party liability insurer, there must be collaboration to explore investigate, assess, and address the evolving risks. Within the IG, we're working very hard to support the membership and the industry in this transition. Currently, there are about 120 committees and working groups addressing not only matters that, that affect the pool and the group activities, but probably every single challenge facing shipping today. The latest being, of course, the Alternative Fuels Working Group. However, while the role of the IG in supporting transition and absorbing risk is key, it's not also not the only answer. And the industry as a whole has recognized that. Today, there are more think tanks, more joint ventures, more research and development, and more new maritime startups than ever before. So while historically I might suggest that collaboration and innovation by creating opportunity out of crisis is nothing new, the scale of this today is simply remarkable. And to what do we owe this, this scale? I suggest, as I emphasized at the start of my speech, that it is the people the people that make the difference. We are sharing, investing, and partnering, and, par and pioneering to meet the needs of future on matters relating to alternative fuels, advanced materials, maritime robotics, port operations, automation, maritime cybersecurity, environmental protection, diversity in maritime, energy transition, just to name a few. In fact, according to oh, an impressive database featured by Thesius IQ, more than 70 emerging maritime innovative technologies are identified. According to this database, there are so very many startups, joint ventures, NGOs, and cooperative innovation initiatives related to maritime that they were able to create a so-called short list of 150, 150. Even more impressive is the level of collaboration between private and government agencies. We all know that while regulation historically drives change, it can also be implemented without input from industry, and as a consequence, sometimes without per precise direction on the exact parameters of the end game. Today, there are 88 international non-governmental organizations with consultative status to the IMO, providing more input to national governments and the IMO than ever before. And even more impressive than this is the fact that major operators, competitors really, are now actively and opening, joining, openly joining forces to ensure the industry as a whole can meet the set targets. The maritime industry recognizes that it must drive progress from within and it must do it collectively. Having said that, it's also important to remember that navigating change requires innovation, but true innovation comes from a greater spectrum of creativity, problem solving, and adaption. And this comes from the human mind and ideas. Innovation is about finding novel and meaningful solutions to problems, creating values in new ways. And at its core, it's right here in this room in all of us. Creativity and ingenuity on such a global scale is only possible because of the strengths of the relationships and the goodwill that we share towards each other. And although everyone in this room might have a different business focus, at the end of the day, we work together and we get what needs to get done. As you may have guessed, I am a big believer in the strength of community. And I'd like to take this opportunity also to praise the chambers for creating this environment. It's events like this that create deeper dialogue and also create awareness for the value of international commerce and the industry. The truth is that most people around the world don't even know or even contemplate the significance of the industry or what exactly it is that we do. In fact, how we are sometimes perceived by the average person reminds me about how my daughter described when she was in second grade, described what I did for a living to her class. As she knew back then, we lived in Greece and that her mom worked in connection with ships at the port of Piraeus. And so she said very proudly, my mom works on the docks. 
And while technically true, okay, <laughs> I bet the visual that she projected was not exactly accurate. Um, a pro common problem probably for many of us here when we're trying to describe what we do. So while shipping is not a very visible industry unless something goes wrong, I cannot think of another sector that carries the same weight of global trade and contributes to the ongoing sustainability, not only of the industry, but of communities around the world. In fact, I feel that the reason that maritime runs under the radar most of the time is because we are so efficient at what we do. And as we navigate the challenges of clean energy in our interconnected world, it's clear that the efficiency of our collaboration and our purposeful focus on innovation towards solutions are our greatest assets. We face geopolitical shifts, a changing risk landscape, regulatory mandates and disparities in resources and political will, but working together, we overcome. The progress we have witnessed is commendable and the momentum must continue. And I hope that as we head into 2024, I can inspire a sense of optimism, balanced, of course, against the realities of unsettled tensions. All this being said, the maritime sector is still subject to black swans that can cause shocks. And shipping has certainly had its fair share, but it makes us more resilient. And as we contemplate the future, may I suggest that we do it with gratitude. Gratitude for those who have paved the way before us with the innovations of yesterday, and gratitude for our place in this world, in this sector, which touches so many lives across the globe. And I would like to conclude with some fitting words by M Mother Teresa. Yes, Mother Teresa, I love to quote her. I can do things you cannot. You can do things I cannot. Together, we can do great things. Thank you.